thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a man who can have his cake and eat it too, Mike Vandebogard. <laughs> Thanks, Joe, and uh, thank you again for everyone that's tuning in. Got a couple quick updates here for you. Well, a lot shorter than our last episode. Uh, first and foremost, like to give a shout out to our newest patron, Jody Carroll. Uh, we always tell you that Joe and I run this on a shoestring budget and any help that we can get from our great listeners is greatly appreciated so thank you jody thank you jody yeah and uh, i've also been updating our patreon benefits so if you head over to our patreon page we now have some swag items there's a mug that you can get uh, stickers hats and we've got some other exciting swag items coming down the pike here pretty soon so keep an eye out for that um mentioned this a couple other times we've got some great interviews coming up joe one of them is with the lead investigator on the laura bradbury case so i'm going that one will be good i'm very excited about that one yeah he uh he's never uh spoken before publicly so he's got a lot of inside information on the case and uh, right now i'm just going back and forth with them uh, via email trying to set up the interview so that should be coming in the next month or so and uh, this was a weird month. We were off for a few months, and then we came back for one episode, and then I had to go get married. <laughs> <laughs> you just had to go get married. And uh, then we went on a honeymoon, so there we only had one episode for October. But uh, starting in November, we should be getting back to our kind of normal two-episode-per-month release. So um, apologize for that little hiccup there. I know some people have been – one guy uh, – commented on uh, our hosting platform he wondered if we were still you know creating episodes i'm like don't worry we'll be back oh yeah we've been getting some people who are upset that we're not producing it fast enough which i love that's great so first apologize but thank you yeah. very much for tuning in and, and caring that much that you're upset that when we're slow yeah and <laughs> uh as always uh, if you like the show or hate the show uh, let us know on you know comments and subscribe to us we we get a lot of people that say they don't like my my random laughing during the episode so i apologize to those of you that i trigger oh you don't have to apologize for <laughs> you being you mike <laughs> and i just did it again um <laughs> but we uh we we take all the feedback good and bad and we just try to make a better show so uh keep it coming we're uh we're thick-skinned but we like the yep. we like the nice comments better <laughs> yeah absolutely um, I'd like to say that uh, this episode is going out to Amanda Baltz and the Baltz family who really wanted us to cover this topic today, uh, which is why we, uh, in this American Urban Legend series, we chose our home state of Wisconsin. So I'm very excited for this. These, uh, I haven't gone over the notes. Joe will be kind of driving this episode, but uh, I've heard of these urban legends before and they're, they're pretty cool. All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. America, a melting pot filled with diverse cultures, beautiful natural wonders, and a historic sense of exploration. Among the vast beauty of our wilderness, there lies a more sinister side, a hidden village of dwarves where trespassers are captured and forced to live among them, a prehistoric bull-horned creature terrorizing a small town, haunted bridges, and a road where scouts no longer help the elderly cross. Join us this week as we explore the urban legends of Wisconsin.
at this time of the episode, we kind of go through a location profile, but Wisconsin, I'm sure many of you have been here before. It's a mixture of, we've got a lot of farmland in the south, and there's a lot of vast uh, forests in the northern uh, part of the state, and we also have a very big coastline on the east east side of the state with Lake Michigan. So instead of kind of going through the location profile of the state, I'm going to just talk about a couple of fun facts that people may not know about Wisconsin. So fun fact number one, Marathon County, Wisconsin, produces the entire ginseng grown in the United States, which amounts to roughly 10% of the world's supply. Now, Joe, I knew Wisconsin produced a lot of ginseng, but I didn't know it was 10% of the world's supply. That's uh, pretty Yeah, crazy. that's a significant amount. Yeah. That's insane. Uh, fun fact number two, the state symbol of Wisconsin, the badger, does not refer to the animal as most people think. Rather, it refers to the lead miners of the 1820s who traveled for work and even dug tunnels to find somewhere to sleep and stay warm. Uh, so that's uh, that's pretty interesting. I didn't know that. I one. didn't know that I, either. <laughs> that one, I always thought it was the animal when I when I was looking through some of the notes and stuff. I was like, holy cow, I did not know that. So I learned that one. Yeah. Uh, fun fact number three, uh, EAA Air Venture Oshkosh, which I've been to many times. Uh, my dad's a pilot, so... Growing up, we were always at Oshkosh. It's the largest meeting of aviators in the world uh, since 1970 has uh, been held right here every summer. During the event, which takes place uh, over a period of a week, the Oshkosh Control Tower becomes the busiest uh, aircraft control tower in the world uh, with approximately 15,000 aircraft landings and 500,000 visitors. It's a really fun thing to do. There's usually a lot of cool military jets on display, and they do flybys and aerobatic shows, and a lot of a lot of really cool stuff to see. Joe, have you made it to EAA before? I actually have never gone to the event. I've been driving through while it was going on, yeah. and it's it always just seems so crazy. And I was never that into planes that I just kind of avoided it. I think, <laughs> yeah, because it's just I mean, half a million visitors yep. for the week. Like it's insane. There's so many people that go there. Yeah, it's it's really cool. I I suggest anyone that's in Wisconsin. I think it happens usually the end of July or early August to check it out if they're around here. It's it's cool, even if you're not that into planes. Uh, it's just a spectacle. Uh, yeah, it's usually followed up by like a smaller show mm-hmm. in Milwaukee. Yeah, that I go to. The Aaron, I do that. Yeah, the Aaron Waters show. That that's also a really fun show. Yeah. So, uh, fun fact number four: the Wisconsin Dells boasts the most number of water parks in a single area in the entire world. Now, I knew this one, but I always find it funny because Wisconsin really has maybe three or four good months of weather that you could yeah. go to a water park. <laughs> I know it's so crazy that we're like our climate does not scream water parks, no. but we got we got the most of them yeah. in one spot in the whole world. <laughs> and I I haven't been to a water park in the Dells since I was a kid, but we used to always go to Noah's Ark. I think that's the biggest water park there. Yeah, now Mount Olympus has been growing, and I've started going back with my kids, and it's actually it's like cool again. Yeah, like you know, I was like cool in the seventies, then it like gets like to be this old thing that's like dying out. And now people are kind of like back into that old like travel visit kitschy northern towns again yeah. so it's like growing again <laughs> yeah and the dells is definitely one of those vacation spots very uh, yeah it's i don't know how to describe it there's it's not expensive and it's a great time yeah that's what it is you get you there's a lot around there and it's not it's not expensive and you can have a really fun time so uh, our final fun fact is close to where joe and i live Summerfest, which is held in milwaukee attracts over 1 million visitors every year uh, this is enough visitors to get this festival into the Guinness Book of World Records as the largest music festival in the world. And Joe, uh, you and I have been to Summerfest probably more times than I can count. Oh, I used to work for yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen so many uh, so many good bands at Summerfest. And for people that don't know, there's a main stage where you have to pay extra to get in, and then there's tons of free stages. And over the years, I've seen a lot of bands that have started on the free stages and then eventually end up on the main stage as the main act for each day. So it it's really cool to go see um, every day. Yeah, for those who don't know, it's like, what is it? $15 to get in. Yeah. And and that's like all, like you get into the main park. Like think of like going to Six Flags Great America. You pay an entrance fee, then you can just wander around and go to any roller coaster. Well, instead of roller coasters, there are a bunch of stages where you have like, you know, Third Eye Blind, Weird Al Yankovic. You'll have- REO Speedwagon. Uh, yeah, REO Speedwagon. We had- um, 
what are some of the bigger ones that we had that were they're just completely free you can walk up to them and there might be a stage right next to it where another band's playing but there's pretty big bands like kid rock came and like he was on one of the free stages once uh slash the snake pit so there are so many bands that come over was it a week and a half two weeks and every night, there's main acts that are playing at every single stage. There's like five or six side stages, and then one main one that you can pay more where you're very large, like Taylor Swift will end up going to the big one. Yeah, and usually it's around the 4th of July, so there's always a big uh, fireworks display, usually halfway through it. So, yeah, really cool, cool event, and a, a cool fact that, you know, Milwaukee's not that big of a city, but we've got one of the world's largest music festivals, so... Yeah, except they canceled it this year because of COVID. That was terrible. I know. I don't even want to talk about it. It was like the it. first year in like 15 years I didn't go. I know. So uh, that that is the end of the fun facts. So Joe is going to dive right into our first urban legend. Yeah, Mike, we got some great urban legends to go over. And these are, like we said before, near and dear to our hearts, just living in the state. Uh, so I intend on saving my favorite for last, okay. which is which is the Haunchyville. So that that's like my absolute favorite. I grew up knowing that one. So we're going to start our show in the city of Rhinelander in northern Wisconsin. Oh, side note, what's also great is I'm going to know the pronunciation of a lot of this yeah, stuff. Yeah, we, we finally... Because <laughs> it's our state. <laughs> we finally won't get the names wrong, which people always yeah. uh, comment about. Yes, because nobody can say Wisconsin city names right. So there we go. All right, so in Rhinelander, which is in northern Wisconsin, in 1893, newspapers reported the discovery of the hodag. Now, the report stated that the animal had the head of a frog, the grinning face of a giant elephant, thick, short legs set off by huge claws, the back of a dinosaur, and a long tail with spears at the end. Now, these reports were initially instigated by Eugene Shepard. At the time, Eugene was a well-known Wisconsin land surveyor and timber cruiser. And for those of you who don't know, a timber cruiser is basically someone that assesses land value. He rounded up a group of local people to capture the animal. The group reported that they needed to use dynamite to kill the beast. So they killed one, and they have a picture, and, and we'll post this picture, I have it, of them you know, standing in front of this the beast. This thing just sounds absolutely terrifying. Yeah, <laughs> and it is. It looks terrifying. Yeah. So a photograph of the remains of the charred beast were released to the media. It was the fiercest, strangest, most frightening monster ever to set, ever to set razor sharp claws on Earth, is what he quoted. It became extinct after its main food source, all white bulldogs, became scarce in the area. <laughs> that hey, that's just odd. White bulldogs is that like a, they yes. mean pets? Yeah, yeah. That that's that's that was the main food source. So Shepard claimed to have captured another hoed egg in 1896. And this one was captured alive. According to Shepard's reports, he and several bear wrestlers placed chloroform on the end of a long pole, which they then worked into a cave where the creature was to overcome it. He displayed the hodog at the first Oneida County Fair, where thousands of people came to see the hodag at the fair that Shepard displayed. He had a shed at his house, and he charged 10 cents for admission. So this is like hilarious back in the day you could really create this type of story and thousands of people believed it. yeah that's crazy um yeah back you know no social media back then no cell phones so it was all word of mouth yeah, so this is one of those urban legends where we know it's fake but the the story continues to live on because shepherd was a well-known prankster in addition to his other exploits so at the time a lot of people believed it was real. Now we know for a fact, well, A, besides the description of the animal, and B, just that it was back in the day. We know it's not real. But at the Oneida Fair, where Shepard had this live hodag available, he connected it to a bunch of hidden wires. And when people would come up every now and then, he would make it move and would send people fleeing in fear. So he had this whole thing rigged up to be this live hodag and trick people into paying him a ton of money to see it. In addition to that, Shepard would often tell the curious customers that the hodag was especially angry that day. In order to convince people that he was telling the truth, he would go into his shed, supposedly in an effort to calm it down. While he was in there, Shepard would change into shredded clothing to make it look like he had been attacked. He would also have his two sons make a lot of noise behind the shed to make the attack sound more convincing. So he had a pretty pretty big operation going on here to kind of fool people. <laughs> 
into thinking. <laughs> oh, 100%. Yeah. It was like a whole sideshow. So as newspapers locally, statewide, and then nationally began picking up the story of this remarkable creature that has never been seen before, a small group of scientists from the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. announced that they would be traveling to Rhinelander to inspect the apparent discovery. Their announcement obviously spelled the end of his gimmick, and he was forced to admit that the hodag was a complete hoax. So you had... Like the Smithsonian Institute scientists were gonna come study this thing. That's how real people thought it was. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty amazing. You, I just can't think something like this would be able to happen today. Well, and uh, like I said, we'll have the pictures. I'll post them on Facebook, yeah. and, and we'll have them available. It doesn't even look real, like at all. It's not even a good, like fake animal. <laughs> Like, it's very apparent that this thing is very fake. And you know what this kind of reminds me is, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, there's been quite a few people that have faked Bigfoot sightings where Uh they will fake the footprints or they'll, I think even some of the guys will get into Bigfoot suits and then. Yeah, you'll get your grainy, shaky footage. Yeah, you know, this maybe this is kind of the the uh, the origin of people hoaxing or faking, you know, weird sightings in the woods it could be i mean yeah if that that got picked up they found it was a hoax they're like you know if people want to mess with other people online or not online uh, just mess with other people that's that's one way to do it it's got to be pretty interesting if you lived back then and picked up a paper and saw a picture of this you know back then newspapers were the authority that's where everyone got their news for everything you don't have a ton of exciting stuff going on yeah so you pick up the newspaper and find this crazy creature is discovered. That's exciting. You get to run around and tell everyone about it. And yeah, now it it's just really funny that uh, this was in Wisconsin. Yes, We're, our state's kind of known for some strange people. <laughs> <laughs> so well, well to to take it further, the hodag did become the official symbol of Rhinelander. So even though they knew it was done, you know, Rhinelander, Wisconsin, the the hodag is the official symbol. It's the mascot of the Rhinelander High School and lends its name to numerous Rhinelander area businesses and organizations. So the Hodag also lends its name as an image to the Hodag County Festival. Uh, The city of Rhinelander's website calls Rhinelander the home of the Hodag. And they have a larger-than-life fiberglass sculpture of the Hodag created by local artists on display at the Rhinelander Area Chamber of Commerce, where it draws thousands of visitors every year to take pictures and stuff. So they have just fully embraced it. Yeah, my kids had a hockey it. tournament up there, and it was the Hodag tournament. And they have this, like, at at the end of the tournament, they have this giant Hodag on the wall that comes out of, like, a doghouse, and smoke comes out of its nose. <laughs> so, uh, just a side note, um, totally not related to the Hodag, but this kind of reminds me of something that happened on my... So, on we I went to uh, Florida on my honeymoon, uh, and we were driving to the Everglades, and we passed... I can't remember the exact name of it, but it was either the American Sasquatch or American Bigfoot headquarters. I I almost turned around to go visit it. Uh, you you should have. I know. I don't know that why was, I didn't. You, you are terrible. <laughs> <laughs> but we were driving by, and I'm like, oh my god, that's the American Bigfoot head. I'll when we post this episode, I'll I'll post a note or something about it because it was off in the middle of nowhere in the Everglades. I was like surprised to see it, but I don't know why now. So like, was it like some guy's house? No, it looked like decided? a museum. Was... Oh, like it's like a legit building. Yeah, and they had like fake Bigfoots like out in the like the wilderness around it. Like, like probably has gun- government funding. Like <laughs> I don't know. It, yeah, it was really close to the Everglades National Park. Maybe some oh, of our God. listeners know what I'm talking about. I I will figure this out after we're done recording this. Yeah, we're gonna. <laughs> I need to look into this. That's got. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm gonna have to go check that out. All right. So our next story brings us to Stevens Point, Wisconsin, where on Highway 66, there is a bridge that has been dubbed the name Bloody Bride Bridge. Now, according to local legend, a bride-to-be was killed in a car accident on the bridge. She, along with her groom, are said to have appeared in the backseat of any car parked on the bridge at midnight, where visitors to the bridge have reported not only apparitions, but also strange fogs and rock formations that will appear. There are even stories of a police officer who hit the Phantom Bride with his car only to have her appear in his back seat. Despite reports of the bloody woman in white appearing in the middle of the road leading to the name Bloody Bride Bridge, no record has ever been found to show that a woman died there, 
nor is there any evidence that a police officer encountered the spirit. So, but that doesn't stop locals from passing on the legend, of course, and it remains a popular spot for, to visit around Halloween. So people that are there uh, go there in Halloween and mm-hmm. keep the legend alive, basically. So this is a really interesting uh, urban legend. So I don't know if you've ever watched the TV show Supernatural. <laughs> I have. Uh, there's an episode where I... this. This episode must be based on this urban legend from Wisconsin because the episode almost sounds like a a blow by blow of the the legend you just read. Really? Yeah. So I I don't know if it's based on this, but it it it's like exactly the same. So just an interesting side it's, note. There. It's a it's a good horror story, I guess. Like it's yeah. it's neat and terrifying and fun to <laughs> believe in. So I mean, that's how most of these legends go because it's more fun to keep believing in it than to prove it wrong. Yeah. So, with that said, though, although that tale doesn't have any backing in real incidents, our next one does. It's another bridge in Wisconsin that is also reported to be haunted. So, this tale brings us to Siren, Wisconsin. And this story goes, in the early 1980s, Rick and Rose Kringle, along with their daughter Jody, were driving in a pickup truck. It was winter, and they hit a patch of black ice, which, if you are in the north, or especially in Wisconsin, are dry and cold, and long winters are terrible, especially when it comes to road ice. Mm -hmm. So, unfortunately, again, this is a real incident, so it's not funny, but the truck flipped over into a swamp, and all three of them tragically drowned. Motorists, however, over the years have claimed that while driving near the site, their radios would be interrupted by the sound of a young girl's voice begging for her life or simply saying, Mommy, help, I can't get out. Wow, that's terrifying. That is absolutely terrifying. Yeah. And they, they basically, I've, I I read a couple comments from people, and again, this is people saying it happened to them, so take that with what you will. Uh, but yeah, the, they'll be listening to the radio or even like CDs, you know, this is back when you had a CD player, Yep. and it would completely static out over this bridge near where the incident occurred, because the incident actually didn't occur on the bridge, it was in a swamp near it, but they said when they got within the vicinity of the bridge their radios would crinkle out and they would hear voices over the, the radio. So I'm not sure if it's very clear what they're hearing or if maybe it's a dead spot on that bridge where it goes out and they think they hear stuff. Yeah. But enough people were saying it that it's something that this legend keeps going on and it's just another one of those places where high school kids go hang out to try and get scared and all that good stuff. Well, and it's interesting and, you know, you can believe in ghosts or not. I I don't really have a theory on it one way or the other. I guess if I had an encounter, I would be a believer. But, you know, from what people say that that's a very common thing to occur is, you know, static or like, you know, their phones cut out or like flashlights go out. Like disruption of radio signals. Disruption of radio signals or electricity right before, you know, an encounter happens. Uh, Now, you know, take that with a grain of salt. (laughs) Like, yeah. you know, any of these legends, but it's just kind of an interesting connection that they all all share. And I don't know what that, you know, f- would have to do with, you know, physics, maybe something with electromagnetic energy or who knows. But yeah, we've all seen the ghost hunting shows where they whip out, you know, half a million dollars worth of equipment to measure changes in temperature and static discharge and yeah. all this other stuff. And it's all this crazy, crazy theories about you know, when apparitions occur. And this is where I'll bridge some of like the stories sometimes sound ridiculous, but when you start talking about other dimensions and things like that and how that works with our world and the dimensions that we can experience where you might start having some bleed over or things like that, where you could have disruptions in space time that could affect our physical world. Doesn't mean it's necessarily ghosts. Maybe, maybe not, but I think there is a lot that we don't understand. And I truly think that based on, think about what science was 200 years ago. And now what science is, what we know with quantum computing and things like that. Mm -hmm. Stuff that you wouldn't even be able to imagine, uh, you know, 200 years ago is now commonplace among us. So so what 200 years from now will be commonplace that we can't imagine? Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting theory. I mean, you always can think like, what if you went back in time with a you know an iPhone to someone that lived 500 years ago? They would you'd be burned for witchcraft. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So you know everything's relative, but uh, you know when it comes to ghosts and things like that, I I probably not a believer. But Joe and I always stress, you know, if I experience something or 
you know, somebody proves something to be real, you know, I, I, I can change my mind. Yeah. I'd say we're healthy skeptics. Yeah. We don't ever write anything off entirely. I, so we're, I'll, I'll always give something it's day in court. No, how, no matter how crazy it sounds. <laughs> uh, but, and, and that's just, and sometimes because it's just interesting to learn, you know, how people think about certain different things. So, yeah. All right. Now we're, we're going to go on to the coup de gras. My favorite story. This is like one that I grew up with like in high school. So this is the story of Haunchyville. And if you're from Wisconsin and don't know what Haunchyville is, then you've had a sheltered life. Because when I was in high school, Mike, and Mike, did you know what Haunchyville was in high school? I heard the name, but I, I guess I lived a sheltered life because I, I didn't really know much oh. about this. And okay, uh, I'll, I'll preface that. I grew up in the Milwaukee area, so it might be because it was it's based around where I live. But everyone I grew up with knew what it was. So Haunchyville is probably the most popular urban legend in Wisconsin. It is a legend that I grew up with knowing about. My friends and I would always talk about and try it. We actually tried finding it once. This is pre-internet. So all the information was passed along from, you know, my cousin's friend or my friend's friend's uncle. Everybody knew somebody who knew somebody who had all the details on Haunchyville. Then this is most urban legends. But remarkably, the main uh, protest of the story was usually consistent between schools and friend groups, which is... I think what was most compelling about it is because we did have friends in other schools. And when we talked about it, the general story was very consistent, mm -hmm. which is what made it seem more real. Now, in this, again, there wasn't as much urban sprawl and development back then. So there was a road in Muskego, Wisconsin called Mystic Drive. And at the end, there is a barn where a farmer allegedly hanged himself. However, underneath the body in the dirt, you could see many child-sized footprints all around where he was hanging. And on the wall, there was a message written in his own blood that said, the haunchies made me do it. So if you would go down the end of Mystic Drive, you can actually still see a barn and sometimes people report of a phantom body hanging at night. So there are actual a place and landmarks that corroborate the story. And if you go down the road, you can also see uh, little small doorways and houses with stop signs that are a much smaller height. Now, this is how the story goes. That part, not so much. But we'll, we'll get into that. So what are the haunchies and why are they there? And I never even understood this name, honestly. But the story goes that the haunchies are dwarves from a sideshow of the circus that used to roll through town on the train. One day, the dwarves were fed up with their lives and murdered the ringmaster of the circus. They cut off his arms and legs and hanged him in the woods. Now, to avoid being arrested or even worse consequences from the circus community... The dwarves set out to create their own community built exclusively for dwarves so they could escape the ridicule and what made them unhappy. So we have this hidden community deep in the woods of Muskego where these dwarves are living. And to add to the tale, at some point, a young albino boy wandered in their community. So this wasn't a dwarf, but it was an albino boy. And because he was different, the boy was treat, uh, was taken by the doors, dwarves and treated as an equal. and they, So they basically welcomed him into the community. Mm -hmm. Now this boy eventually grew up to be an old man. And this is where the story was always consistent. This old man lived in a normal-sized house that was on the outskirts of this dwarven village of Haunchyville. And he's said to be at the end of the drive. And you could run into him. And he always had a shotgun warding off people from looking for Haunchyville. So if you went searching for Haunchyville, you'd come across an albino old man with a shotgun that would shoot you if you got too close. <laughs> wow. So there are tons of stories, and I had this growing up, of your cousins, cousins, friends, friends, friend, etc., that have been there and were chased off by the old man or were driving down the road and rocks started being thrown at their car so they quickly t turned away. Or even worse, people were shot at mm -hmm. by the old albino man. However... We can only find one interview from a supposed witness. And this video is on YouTube from Marquette University Television Station. <laughs> and we're going to play the audio right now, but you'll be able to look this up later. As I was told, the story of Haunchyville was there were uh, there was a circus, and the circus shut down, and the carnies had no other place to go. So they set up all the, the people from the sideshow and the freak show all set up camp near uh, big Muskego Lake and because they were shorter people they built their houses to suit their needs we ended up one night we heard about it and so we decided we were going to go try and find it 
me and my friends, then we drove around for a while and eventually traced back to its or uh, traced it to Big Mosquito Lake near Mystic Road. We had to park kind of far away, and there was a long entryway. It was a gate. It was a huge gate. It should have been our first warning, but we parked and went in anyway. We walked probably half mile or so through the woods ended up going and finding seeing these small houses in these kept hearing this weird high-pitched screaming sound it wasn't human it, I don't know what it was but as we get closer to one of the houses it kept it kept getting louder and more and more intense so as we walked in um, we looked it kind of looked like golem from Lord of the Rings when he's eating the fish, except he was eating a rabbit and you're hearing rabbit <laughs> screams. And looked up and he had sharp fangs, his teeth. It looked like all his teeth were filed down and something must have seen us because he got spooked and alerted and he started making all kinds of noise, noises I couldn't even attempt to try and recreate. They, they didn't sound human either. So we went, we started running through the woods trying to get back to our car and it was then, we, like, their houses started emptying out, and there was, I don't know, there had to be 20 or 30 of them that were, that were trying to find us and chase us through the woods, but it was their woods, so they knew it better than we did. We are doing everything we could to hide and keep on moving as quietly as we could, and that's when we were staying kind of close to a road, and there was a, a van that pulled up, and this giant, it was an albino, Kind of like the guy in House of a Thousand Corpses, the uh, <laughs> the one older brother guy that was kind of just bigger and bulkier. He was his guy had his eyes shone red and light, and he was just a scary freak. And he started shooting. He, he actually ended up peppering our car with <laughs> shotgun blasts as we were rolling, as we were escaped away. And that was the story of my experience at Hauntingville. <laughs> So, so to your point, Mike, you have this guy like totally set up silhouette yeah. telling this story. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think Joe and I, you just, we discussed this before we recorded today that, you know, that may, that video may be satire <laughs> or. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's satire, but it's, you know, that's the first hand account encounter in Haunchyville. Yeah. It's probably fake. Uh, it's entertaining because that is, I'd say, verbatim the story you would hear from people who had a cousin's cousin go to Haunchyville, and everybody knew somebody or had or knew uh, a link, you know, seven seven layers of Kevin Bacon or whatever. Yeah, seven degrees of Kevin Bacon. Uh, everybody knew somebody who found Haunchyville and had that experience where they were chased away. Yeah. And, you know, slight variations, but they're always chased away. And obviously, more often than not, they're shot at because that's really exciting. Uh, and people would, you know, I remember in high school, people would get in their cars and go off and drive around Muskego and go try and find Haunchyville. This is like a thing that <laughs> happened. Yeah. And I, I think deep down we knew it wasn't real, but there you go. Yeah, it's a... Uh... No, it's an interesting, interesting story. I think, uh, you know, a, a little village off in the woods filled with dwarves. I mean, it <laughs> it sounds crazy, um, but yeah, that's it's funny because Muskego. I mean, there's not a lot of wooded areas around Muskego. Well, not anymore. So that video is from 2014, and the pictures in there are actual pictures of at the end of Mystic Drive. So you saw there's like the little cobblestone house. Yep. And uh, I encourage you guys. We'll we'll post this on Facebook too. We'll kind of do that thing where we have like a an album of all the show pictures and stuff. We'll we'll have a link to this video, but go watch it. It's all pictures from there, and those come from uh, the most interesting work that I found on this topic was from a local writer named Matt Wild. Uh, he wrote for some local magazines and papers at the time. And in 2010, I think it was the AV Club he wrote for. Do you remember that that print I do, catalog? yeah. So in 2010, he went on a search for the infamous Haunchyville. He's like the first investigatory journalist that went in search of Haunchyville uh, and basically went to the area that was described in all legends. He came across a wooded area that had all the telltale signs, literally. He was met with a ton of keep off the road, no trespassing signs. Uh, and he did find a bunch of tiny cobblestone houses 
uh, that we have pictures of, and we'll post those online. But don't get your hopes up, however. Uh, he wrote an online article that he revisited the area in 2015, so he went back five years later and found basically it all been cleared out to make room for urban sprawl. So we have all the McMansions and subdivisions going up to where it used to be, but it was heavily wooded back when I was in high school. I graduated in 2003. So it was, you know, not like what it is today. Yeah. It wasn't cleared out. So it totally fit the bill. It was an old, you know, dusty rock road that went to nowhere and there was all farm community and a ton of woods there. So it kind of went along. So the story, however, was popular enough that it inspired Garth Ennis, who is the creator of the Punisher series, uh, to use the legend as a basis for a two-part story in which little people form their own mob and cut off their rival mobster's legs from the knees down. So as Haunchyville residents supposedly did to their trespassers. So he was actually uh, inspired by that urban legend to make it into a real popular culture event in the Punisher stories. Yeah, it's cool. And uh, yeah, I love the, the Punisher movies are, are great. Um, so Joe, I have two honorable mentions that I actually, while we were recording, looked up and figured I'd mention them just because we're talking about Wisconsin. And so these aren't urban legends per se. And one of them is not really just limited to Wisconsin, but a, a really terrible event happened here in Waukesha. So the first one is a slender man. You remember all of the, it was around 2014. Oh my God. I'm embarrassed that I didn't even go over that. <laughs> well, it's, was that, but, but that wasn't, that wasn't native to Wisconsin. No, it wasn't really native to Wisconsin. Okay. Yeah. That you said the name and I like got like this, like chill over my body that I missed probably the biggest one. But no, that was more national. So okay. it was more national, but <laughs> it, something terrible happened in Waukesha. So people who, who don't know what Slender Man is, it's a fictional supernatural character that originated as a, a creepy pasta internet meme created by Something Awful uh, forums back in 2009. And it's depicted by a thin, unnaturally tall humanoid with featureless head and face wearing a black suit. So this picked up attention back in 2014 when a moral panic, a moral panic occurred over the Slender Man after readers of the, his fiction were connected to several violent acts, including a near-fatal stabbing of a 12-year-old girl here in Waukesha, Wisconsin. So these girls, um, a couple of the other girls, were said they were convinced by Slender Man to hold down one of their classmates, and they stabbed her 19 times out in the woods. And they claimed that Slender Man had wished them to commit murder as a first step to becoming proxies for the Slender Man. So... Um, Really creepy. There's a yeah I, that made national news. That was a big story. Yeah, there's a I think there's a documentary on Slenderman on either Netflix or Amazon. Like I said, it's not not it didn't originate in Wisconsin, but of course, really terrible act of these girls. Yeah, that was the biggest thing that resulted as of the story. And uh, on a positive note, the girl survived. She did survive, and which was great. Um, but yeah, just a terrible incident where you know you had you know several girls holding down another girl and stabbing her over this fictional Slenderman character. Yeah, and they they interviewed her parents, and her parents were like very goth and very dark, mm -hmm. and it looked seemed more like it was like. Nobody told these twelve-year-olds that Slender Man's not real. Yeah, but it's uh, it, <laughs> it, it's, it, it was bad. Yeah, it's just a creepy, really creepy kind of legend, um, fit, you know, supernatural character. And I just thought it was kind of. I figured, you know, we should mention it as kind of a, you know, honorable mention to our urban legends. Yeah, I think that's. I think that was relevant because the most major outcome of that legend, not even really a legend, but that story was that incident in Wisconsin. So I, I'll allow it. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you allowed it. So the uh, the final other honorable mention, you may have heard this one as well, is the smiley face killer. Have you, have you heard this one before, Joe? I have heard that one, yes. Yeah, so basically anybody who's not familiar. That one, I, I wouldn't even call that technically an urban legend just yet. Well, it yeah, I mean, it's so uh, for anyone who doesn't, it's it's a Midwest thing. So for anyone who doesn't know what the smiley face uh, murder theory is, it was a theory advanced by a retired New York City detective, Kevin uh, Gannon and Anthony Duarte. Um, 
And I think Dr. Lee Gilbertson, a criminal justice professor and gang expert at St. Cloud uh, State University. They allege that a number of young men found dead in bodies of water across several Midwest states from the late 1990s to 2010s did not actually drown as concluded by law enforcement agencies, but were victims of a serial killer. And the connection to all of these killings would be they'd find graffiti of a smiley face, kind of where they find the body. And these these cases are really bizarre. And, you know, this kind of is outside of what we normally talk about in Locations Unknown. We usually don't go into serial killer type uh, cases. But because this has happened in... This has happened up in Lacrosse. Um, As I say, Lacrosse had like a string of events. Yeah, so p- typically people, it would happen around you know St. Patrick's Day or one of the holidays where you know college guys go out and you know have a few beers, <laughs> and they'd get pretty drunk. And the law enforcement would figure, yeah, they wandered near the river and fell in and drowned, but they would always find their bodies several days later. Uh, wherever they find the bodies, there would be a smiley face like graffitied under a bridge or like on a retaining wall right near where they were, the bodies were found. Yeah. And it was always, it was always college age males. It was, they were always by themselves. Yeah. From like age, like 20 to like 30. Yeah. And they were always, so, so that's why, and this is where I said, I don't know necessarily would consider this an urban legend just yet because I actually do have legitimately, I can't reveal source, but I have inside information that, uh, the Milwaukee Police Department built an entire task force to study this. They and they, they and what the reason was, they would have strings of these quote unquote accidental deaths near college campuses in areas and pockets. So like there was a bunch up by La Crosse, and then all of a sudden there was a bunch down by Milwaukee, and they would happen in a very small amount of time in an area, and then kind of move somewhere else. I remember it had to have been six or seven years ago. Now was the last. A mysterious drowning here in Milwaukee of a college age guy. It was St. Patrick's Day. He was in the bar. He was with his friends. He leaves. They have him on video. He doesn't look very drunk. And he kind of wanders out of video shot. And then they find him in the river, you know, days or weeks later. And he, this, this guy was one of many in Milwaukee that this has happened to. And like Joe said, it's happened in the cross. I think it's also happened um, in other states. It's happened down in Chicago, I think St. Louis. Uh, so it's it's a Midwest thing, but I, I figured it would be an honorable mention. We could probably do a, a, a whole series of episodes on the smiley face, you know, theory. <laughs> Dude, if you get me, yeah, you know what? Because I do like breaking up the the unsolvable stuff every now and then and doing a little bit of something different. That might be a good segue for like a few episodes towards the end of the season when we want to do something a little bit different. Yeah. But it, yeah, it's, it's, it's very bizarre and, uh, you know, pretty terrifying to think that, you know, this guy was going around for, you know, two decades killing college age guys. Yeah. Um, I think it's slow. You know, I don't think there's been anything recently that they've like, well, there was the pause in part of what this, and I, I heard this from insider people in the government. That's how I knew about it. Uh, from people that are very connected, there was a pause for a little bit and then they started up again so that the task force was built and they were basically trying to find records of inmates to see if there was somebody that would fit the description that might do this that was locked up for another reason during a period of time where the slowdown occurred. Yeah. Because there was like a string of them and it stopped for like a year or two and then all of a sudden started happening again. And it was at a volume higher than what you'd expect because it's like not normal for drunk people to fall and die in icy rivers. That's like that's and, and it was happening at a rate that's beyond what you consider, you know, like a scientifically normal data point for that to happen. Yeah. And it, and then the just the finding the graffiti almost always where they'd find yeah. the body is also makes you f- makes you think that they didn't actually fall in, that the bodies were were dumped there. Um, yeah. But that's for another episode. But I figured it was just uh, because that does that has quite a few guys have been killed or have died in Wisconsin that have supposedly maybe been, you know, connected to the smiley face theory. So just another kind of creepy ur- urban legend, you know, thing. Yep. Think about that during Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thanks again for tuning into the show. Uh, we appreciate all of you for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. 
Be sure to like us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and listen. You can listen to the show there as well as uh, we do post other video content. And if you do want to support the show, you can buy our swag off the Facebook store. We have new hats. A, uh, we do. Oh yeah, we got the the pink hats. Those are from high demand. So we got some pink hats now. Um, I don't want to say just for the ladies because I'll get canceled. Uh, but <laughs> mostly ladies were requesting that we did it. That's why we made those. So yep, we got them up and live. Go go buy those up. Uh, and we just appreciate all of our loyal listeners that keep the show going. And just remember when enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or just taking a walk to leave no trace. And we're actually going to close out. I got permission to play this song. It's a, a Sunspot. Sunspot Universe is the band, and they do a podcast. They wrote a song about Haunchyville. So we're closing out with the Haunchyville show, sh- song. We'll play it in its entirety. And thank you for permission to use from Sunspot. And uh, we'll post a link. They, they do a, a, a mini-sode on the Other Side podcast where they do this. So thanks, and we'll see you next time. Going down the old farm road, and you're not alone. There's something in the cornfield. Are you fast enough to outrun an albino with a shotgun? He's got a secret he ain't gonna reveal. So watch out for the little guys. They'll cut you down. She's made me do